Hello everyone, I'm Shishir Patil and I'm a research scientist at Meta. Today I'm super excited to talk about agents and agentic evaluation. A quick disclaimer before I begin. The presentation today will include content from academic literature and open source projects, and some of the views shared are my personal views and not necessarily representative of those of Meta. Let us begin by looking at how we interact with LLMs today. So on the left-hand side, you have all the different LLMs that some of you might use frequently. I have shown you as the user at the center of it, and the whole digital world, which you can access through your different APIs, tools, and services on the right-hand side. If you were to capture one interaction today, it would look something like this. You would go to, say, meta.ai or your favorite chatbot. You would prompt the LLM. You would get a response. And while I have shown this as a single shot interaction, this could actually be multiple back and forths. But once you get the response, it's up to you as the user to then take this response and perform an action on the digital world and then observe the response, right? Now, this is how many of us tend to interact with chatbots today. Now, with agents, our goal is the following. Can we actually flip this around? Can we have an agent that sits at the center rather than the user sitting at the center? Now, in this scenario, you would prompt the agent with your request. The agent would perform an action. Now, while I say perform an action, this action could also be just reading the state of the world or just you know, gathering information. Then the agent observes the response and then articulates that back to the user. Now, the reason I find this very exciting is because this is based on this fundamental observation that humans are good at distinguishing, whereas LLMs are really good at generating. Now, let me explain this with one simple example, all right? If you were to come to me with two recipes on how to bake a cake and ask me, hey, which, hey, Shisha, which one do you prefer? It's very hard for me to just look at the recipes and then predict which cake I might prefer. On the other hand, if you were to bake the two cakes and then let me have a bite each, then I can very quickly tell you which recipe of the cake I prefer because I can now look at the output. While with agents, we are trying to enable the same. Let the agents perform the action so then the users can just observe the action and then distinguish whether they like it or not. Now, this is a little too abstract, I do recognize. So let me ground this in one concrete example. Now, many of us are machine learning researchers and a common ask has been GPUs. Now, in this scenario, suppose a user comes in and it says, hey, can I get an 800 GPU in East US? Now, there's three things we want the agent to do, right? The first is reasoning and planning. Now, East US is how one hyperscaler names its region. It might be slightly different in the other hyperscalers. So the agent has to first reason and plan and understand which particular hyperscaler the user is referring to. Second, as retail consumers, oftentimes you have quotas on how many parallel GPUs you can have it running at any given point in time. So the LLM has to read the state of the world, which in this case would mean you try to understand, well, does the user have the quota to spin up the instance or not? And finally, the LLM has to perform the action or the agent has to perform the action wherein it would start a GPU instance and then return the artifact back to the user. And the artifact in this case might be an SSH terminal session that will let the user log in to the, to the GPU instance. So this is the agentic future that we envision. Now, let's go one step down and then try to understand what are agents. Now, it's not lost on me that almost everyone seems to have a definition for agents, but that's okay. I will give you mine. So for me, agents includes three components. The first is the LLM model itself. The second is the framework. And the framework is the one that orchestrates the LLM model along with the tools that's available to the agent. Now, the framework in addition would also maintain state, take care of fault tolerance, so on and so forth. Now, in this sort of semantics of what an agent is, how do we evaluate agents? So let's begin by looking at, well, how would one evaluate an LLM model for agentic behavior? Now, what helps an LLM interact with tools by orchestration by the framework is function calling. Function calling today is also called tool calling, or you might refer to it as invoking APIs. But fundamentally, what you want the LLM to do is give you a syntactically accurate function call that will help you now interact with external tools and services. And in doing so, one thing that's necessary is to have an offline evaluation of function calling. Now, an online evaluation would mean you get the function call from the agent, 
and then you actually execute the function call and observe the response. You can see how this is not really always desirable if you want to run evaluations at scale. So offline evals require that once you get a response from an LLM, you can actually verify if the function call is actually accurate or not. Now, one way to do this, which is pretty interesting, is to take the API function call and then use a concept that we borrow from programming languages literature called abstract syntax trees. So let me walk you through with an example. On the top left-hand side of the screen, you have one function call. So this is a Python function call. We're trying to invoke the PyTorch vision library to get one particular model. The first thing that we do, as showcased on the left-hand side, is we build a tree out of this function call. And then we take a tree that's built out of all the function calls that's possible by the service provider or Torch. And then we ask a simple question, is my API call a proper subtree of the set of all API calls that's available or not? If it is a proper subtree over here, as you can see from the highlighted component, then we can tell that this is actually a pretty valid function call. Now, the reason we can do this is because given a snapshot in time, the set of functions that a provider gives you is fixed. Now, across time, this varies. Functions evolve. We know that very well. But given a snapshot in time, this can be built. And second, when you want to call functions, it's really beneficial for the function provider as well if more and more agents use that functions. So the incentives are so well aligned that building this tree is not really that challenging. Although there are some technical subtleties to, to keep in mind, right? So for example, you know, if you want the model name, then it's an exact string match. On the other hand, if you have something like the temperature argument when you do an inference API call, that can be a floating point number within a particular range. So you need to do a range query. And in Python function calls, like in this example, you might have optional arguments like pretend equals true or pretend equals false. And so you have to be careful in how do you build and how do you use this AST in evaluating function calls. But thankfully, there is an academic project called the Berkeley Function Calling Leaderboard that looks at all the different LLMs and then evaluates them on their ability to call and invoke functions, right? So this could be in a single-turn scenario, multi-turn scenario, so on and so forth. So by adopting a technique from PL called the abstract syntax tree, what you get is a very robust way to evaluate function calls offline. And you know, function calling in LLMs becomes one of the key capability of the LLM to enable agentic behavior. Okay, that's great. We just looked at, you know, how do we evaluate one component of an agent, which is an LLM model for, for its agentic capability. Now, let's try to zoom out a little and ask the question, well, how do we evaluate an entire agent on its ability on agentic behavior? So to evaluate agents, an excellent example of what a complete system looks like is the MLGEM, released just a few months ago by folks at Meta along with their collaborators, MLGEM is a unified framework that enables researchers to easily implement and experiment with different machine learning training algorithms for large language model agents. The MLGEM itself consists of two components. The first is the environment, and the second is the MLGEM bench, which is the benchmark. Now, this is what the MLGEM environment would look like. You can start to slot all the different components into a handy definition of agents that we just saw a few slides ago. So you have the agent itself consisting of the prompts, the models, and the tool description on the left-hand side in blue. And then you have the gym environment that interfaces the agent, has access to the computer through the shell command, and additional file system commands that help you, you know, open, close some files, and then edit some files. So given a task, now the agent operates in this environment to solve the task. And then moving on from the environment, you have the MLGIM bench. Now the MLGIM bench consists of 13 diverse and open-ended AI research tasks from domains including computer vision, natural language processing, reinforcement learning, and game theory. Now solving these tasks requires the real-world AI agent to have a bunch of skills such as generating new ideas and hypotheses, creating and processing data, implementing the ML methods, training the ML model, running experiments, analyzing the results, and iterating through this process as the agent tries to accomplish an ML task. Now, what this gives you is a very rich framework from which you can very concretely understand the different axes of LLM agents, in particular with this benchmark, machine learning LLM agents. For example, here's one result from the paper 
where on the x-axis we have different steps. So a step is each interaction of the LLM with the environment. And on the y-axis, you have the different counts. What we measure here in different colors is the different tools or the different operation that the agents perform. So this is very intuitive and nice to see, right? Because initially, what the agent focuses on is in more exploratory tasks. So this includes like using your shell command to navigate the repository, trying to look at the data, understand the data. As you move later and later in the process, what we observe is that your agents now start actually performing actions like, oh, editing the file, running experiments, submitting the experiments for validation, so on and so forth. So, you know, when you have such a rich ecosystem, you can actually look through how the agents are performing and then use this in your agentic evaluation. Well, okay, that's fantastic. We looked at what agents are, we looked at how to evaluate them. Now at Meta, we have been building a lot of these components already, right? So almost a year ago, we shipped the first Llama 3 models, and then the Llama herd has had several updates in the last 12 months. Now the Llama 3 offered a spectrum of options depending on your use case. So the 8P model was the ultra-fast option that could be run by anyone, even locally, on your local machine. And the flagship 405B model was the go-to for distillation, synthetic data generation, so on and so forth. And then we had the 1B and the 3B variants that opened up new use cases such as running your LLMs right on device, including your smartphones. And then we also had the 11B and the 90B models that brought multimodality for LAMAs for the first time and opened up multimodal use cases. And lastly, the LAMA 3.370B gave performance equivalent to 405B model at the fraction of the cost. With LAMA 4, we introduced natively multimodal models. So these are MOEs, the Scout with 16 experts, and the Maverick with 128. Now, the LAMA 4 models offer strong performance on multilingual, long context, and multi-image reasoning scenarios at a much lower cost. So this is on the models, which is the first part. Now, we have also been building LAMA Stack, which is the framework. Now, when we were building LAMA Stack, the team set out to build it with one simple goal. It should be easy to build with the LAMA models. So there are a few axes where this becomes interesting, right? The first is, can we support across different models with varying capabilities. The second is the breadth of tasks that we want to support, the breadth of tasks that the developers want to do with Llama models. So this includes inference, different ways to use it for safety, or like adding safety on top. Some of them may want to fine tune it for their own local use cases. Of course, evaluation is a big part of it, so on and so forth. And finally, the environment that you're running these models on. You might want to run this locally, or you might want to use a hosted service or an enterprise that requires VPC or on-prem solutions. So with the Llama stack, as we see here, we want to enable all of these use cases, right? So a rich framework would make it very easy for you to try the Llama models on these different scenarios and so much more. For example, telemetry. We, we heard that that's very important for people building this. And finally, also having a way to have very robust state and state and process management. Now, what this would look like if you were to build with Llama stack is as developer, you would develop CLIs, you would develop client SDKs on, that then goes and you know users can use to interface with it. And then you might rely on inference providers or a hosted inference endpoint. And then Llama stack is a framework that sits right at the center, right? So it's the one that does all the stuff that we just spoke about. And so I would, I would encourage you to check out the Llama models, the Llama stack, and then try and see how you can build very efficient agents with this. Now in building this, we have, at least I have personally had a few interesting observations that I would like to share so that many of you can benefit as well. Well, the first is optimizing for agentic capabilities is extremely tricky. Now the reason is agentic capabilities actually consists of multiple sub capabilities, right? So let's take an example of a SWE agent. Now, a SWE agent not just requires the LLM to be very efficient at function at coding, but it also needs to be extremely efficient at instruction following, long context, so on and so forth. And one you know, way that I found it super useful to evaluate agents and to optimize is to actually try and understand, can we isolate these variables and then try to improve each one of them individually and then hope and then try and evaluate later on if they come together and if not, try to understand why is it that it's not coming together. So that's one handy tip. The second handy tip is that determining when an agent is finished 
is super hard. Right? So if you want to have agent tech systems, just trying to understand, well, when is the agent really done is extremely tricky. So you could think of different techniques, how you could you know, try to address this. One of them could be simply prompting. Say, hey, look, you know, use no more than so many logical steps, et cetera. And then can you try and understand if the LLM is able to follow that? Or on the other extreme, it could be, well, can I go ahead into the agentic framework and then mask out, say, end of sequence tokens? So then the agent knows when to keep going, and then you can bring that back in, and then you can understand when to stop it. Now for ML Gym, we use something in between wherein we have a set threshold, that's 50 steps. And at each step, we tell the agent what step it is on and then remind it that it has only 50 steps. And by doing so, we can now control and sort of tame this agentic systems, both for evaluation and actually in using them. And finally, we find agents can be extremely effective when they can be personalized. You can see how if you have an agentic system, sometimes you might want it to just you know, use the LLM's historical knowledge to answer a given question, or sometimes you want the agentic system to actually use all the tools that's available to it to respond to the user. Where does cost come in? Where does latency come in? So all of these things mean that a very personalized agent is extremely effective. Okay, great. So we looked at what agents are. We looked at, well, how do we evaluate agents? What I want to leave you with is a little bit of peek into the future, right? Or in my view, where I think this field is headed. And the ultimate goal is to have autonomous agentic systems. Why do I say that? Well, we start off with this sort of infographic where we said the user is at the center of it. One of the benefits of putting the user at the center of it is that the users can now verify the process, right? You look at, you go to a chatbot, you get a, you get a response, you can now analyze the response before you then take this and perform an action. We said, well, the benefit of agentic systems is that you can verify the output, which is great because now it's much easier to do. But there's one observation, right? Even if you were to verify just the output, no matter how easy it is, you would still end up becoming the bottleneck. Like the ability for an agent to operate is now bottlenecked by the rate at which you can verify the output. So in an autonomous agentic system, what you would have is you would have multiple agents all interacting with each other and then interacting with the digital world where you as the user are going to have two properties, right? The first is that you're only going to observe downstream tasks. So when you have different agents interacting, you would not want to look into the gory details, but you would rather like to see what the end result is and decide if that's favorable or not. And second, wouldn't it be amazing if the users can have a punctuated attendance? So maybe once a day, maybe once a week, maybe a little bit more frequently, but if you can tune how often you want to go and monitor an agent, what this would give rise to is a truly autonomous agentic system. Now, this gives rise to many interesting research questions, right? Well, does this mean that agentic interactions need to have an undo? Does this mean that all agent interactions need to be associative, right? We, we don't know. So I think there's a lot of open research questions and very exciting problems to solve now in trying to build this autonomous agentic systems. Well, with that, I'd like to conclude. So today we looked at agents and agentic evaluation, beginning with one definition of agents, and hopefully I've convinced you that it's a good definition to use, which is an agent consists of three components, the LLM itself, the framework that then orchestrates the LLM with the different tools that's available. We then looked at the Berkeley Function Calling Leaderboard and the ML Gym Bench as two rich and robust frameworks for agentic evaluation. And finally, we looked into what does the future with autonomous agents look like and some of the open research questions there. Thank you very much.